Hello, it's season 14, episode 30 of the Ubuntu podcast, and this is the last one. It's Tuesday, the 21st of September, as we record this, and in this week's episode, we're going to predict the future, and we'll have double bubble command line love, uh, a little bit of listener feedback, and we'll talk a little bit more about what's going to happen after this show ends, which is nothing uh, <laughs> <laughs> however the next day on uh the 1st of october at eight o'clock uk time if you jump on our youtube channel link in the notes you'll find us staring at you down through your computer screen and you can chat to us and we will have a little session of uh socializing and thinking about times of yore before we did this podcast. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who has contributed over the years to this podcast, including the presenters, uh, Tony, Laura, Simon, and Davey, and all of our guest presenters, and also Joe Ressington for being the producer and general fixer of problems. And a big thank you to Andy Smith and Bitfolk, who provided us with free hosting since the very beginning of the show and didn't really ask for any very much in, in return, to be honest. And everyone who's financially supported us on Patreon and PayPal, it's been very kind and very humbling to have you send us your hard-earned cash so that we can sound a little bit better, thanks to Joe. If you want to continue chatting to us, uh, then jump on our Telegram channel. It's ubuntupodcast.org slash Telegram, or follow us on Twitter, where it will be silent after the 1st of October. <laughs> uh, but Telegram's probably the best place to uh, to contact us. And as well as all those previous presenters, there's these two. Hello, Mark. How are you? Hello. I'm still here. Yay. And Martin, how are you? I'm fine. I noticed Mark and I didn't get a mention in thank you to the presenters. You know, a bit like last week where your favourite episode didn't feature either of us. But it's fine. You should have written your name in the notes, and then I would have read it out. <laughs> but you didn't. So there you go. I thought common courtesy would dictate that you did that anyway, but apparently not. It's fine. I was leaving the best till last. Artistic Martin. differences. This is why it's ending, everyone. Alan is an a**. Oh, no, I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, Mark, what have you been up to recently? What have I been up to? I watched The Matrix for the first time in probably longer than I've been doing this show. Does it hold up or is it just as rubbish as it was when it first came out? You know what? It does hold up. I mean, when I was, it came out when I was at school and... I watched it probably about a dozen times, maybe more. Like, you know, we had it on VHS and oh, it wow. came it came in a cardboard sleeve with shiny bits on. And, you know, it would be like the film that you'd watch around your mate's house. Like it was the cool film of the time. Um, and I just haven't watched it. I think I watched the sequels once each and then I haven't watched it for years and years and years. But there's a new one coming out. So I thought, all right, it's on Netflix. I'll give it a watch. I'll see what it's like. And you know what? I thought it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I remember getting the DVD, and I'm pretty sure the DVD came out in the States about the same time as it, as the film came out in the cinema over here, and I got the US version of the DVD. And I remember watching it on a 14-inch Sony <laughs> Trinitron TV in my bedroom, letterboxed. Yeah. So <laughs> there was very little viewing area. How close to the TV were you? <laughs> yeah, pretty close. It was in my bedroom. <laughs> Um, and I was playing the DVD on a Creative Labs uh, DVD drive in my Pentium P200 uh, <laughs> PC with an accelerator card, a DXR2 oh, accelerator card. I had and one I, of those. They were so good. <laughs> they were great, weren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they really were. I had giant speakers, like ridiculous for those speaker aficionados. I had TDL, RTL2 speakers, which are floor standing uh, speakers in the bedroom and this tiny little 14 inch sony telly <laughs> <laughs> the matrix brings back memories of that uh that time it's yeah yeah it's a very good film yeah it does bring back some memories i i seem to remember that from from the sort of mid to late 80s the the ratio of buying speakers were if they were big enough to be buried in that was the right size yes. <laughs> and and the matrix itself it was a format shifter wasn't it because it was the film that actually uh got a lot of people moved over to dvd it was mm. like the the big conversion title 
I still have that DVD. I have a feeling on one side it's 4x3 and on the other side it's 16x9. I have a feeling, the, yeah. ed- the edition I have. And I maybe. think it's the only DVD that's made every use of every facet of like the DVD protocol, which was why so many players mm. couldn't play it, because it wasn't <laughs> just start the film, watch the film. It got all of those interactive menus and snippets built in and all the rest of it. Yeah, I remember there was there was... Because there's the three films which people remember, but there was also the Animatrix, which was a series of like shorts. But there was also a game called Enter the Matrix, um, which filled in a lot of the gaps in between the films or in between scenes in the films. But it had the uh, a sort of hacking mode you could use to unlock extra things where you got like a command line prompt and you had to like dig around the file system to try and hack into the system and unlock things. It was very cool. Nice. What about you, Martin? What have you been up to? I've stopped using Facebook and WhatsApp. I'll get you. I know. Uh, apparently, it, it was a hipster thing to do about five years ago, but I'm doing it now. You're you're joining all the cool kids who are like 15 years old who don't use Facebook and WhatsApp. I'm making a relevant protest right, down okay. with the man. Is this because you can't be bothered to install the apps on your new iPhone? Actually, yes, it is exactly <laughs> for that reason. Let me tell you a very brief story. When my wife was moved to the (laughs) iPhone, the one impossible mission I had was migrating her WhatsApp data from her Android phone to her iPhone because the backups that WhatsApp make are not format compatible. You cannot move your backups from Android to iPhone. It is the most impossible thing on earth unless you're prepared to spend money on some very hinky software so i went through that for my wife and i thought you know what i don't really use facebook i never use whatsapp so i told all my friends and family i'm not using these things anymore remove them from all of my tablets and phones and i won't be going through that process when i move from android to iphone Interesting. I did remove the uh, Facebook app from my phone Mm -hmm. a little while ago, Mm -hmm. and I've noticed in TikTok, Facebook is the most prominent advert on TikTok, and I think it's because it knows I don't have the app installed, and so it punches me in the face with the Facebook advert all the time. All yeah. the time. Yeah, I know. I should get rid of TikTok as well. Shut up. I'm not no, no, no. I wasn't going to say that. I, I'm agreeing with you entirely that that is exactly what's happening. <laughs> anyway... Other than, you know, dancing on TikTok, what have you been up to recently? I bought a car. Oh, really? Well, I've ordered one. Yes. Is it a Tesla? No, it's not, but it is electric. <laughs> it is an EV. Oh. Yes. I uh, I decided now that I'm nearly 50 is time I bought my first brand new car. I've never had a brand new car in my life. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I think I'm about ready to do that. So uh, I got prepared to flush 20% of the value of the car down the drain in VAT and uh, <laughs> bought myself a new car. I bought a um mini uh, ev very nice yes uh i probably won't get to use it very much because probably uh claire's going to use it for commuting to reduce our uh fossil fuel uh expenditure but i'll get to have a little play on the weekend and in the evenings and this is on account of you working in office that's walking distance from yeah exactly the home, i can't really justify buying a car you're totally yeah. green you're so know, green right, right now yeah. wow I know. <laughs> check it out uh it's uh delayed i'm probably not going to get it until christmas or the new year so I might have it Ooh. as a Christmas present. So it's a race between that and the Steam Deck. Yes. Oh, how exciting. Oh, really? Yeah. The, Steam, the Steam Decks aren't due this year, are they? Uh, some of the early ones are. Sophie's is uh, due the end of this year. Mine is wow. due next year. Oh, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I languished on that. I don't think mine's like until Easter or something. Yeah. Anyway, let's get on with the show. So we thought we'd uh, make some predictions for the future. We often, in the last episode of the season, uh, do uh, predictions for the following year. And this time we get to do it with impunity because there's no further episodes where people can say whether we were right or wrong. So we can say whatever we like. Um, So uh, where should we start? Should we start with, we've we've kind of carved these up into Ubuntu predictions and non-Ubuntu predictions. Should we start with the Ubuntu ones? Yeah, that seems, seems relevant. Mark, what's your first Ubuntu prediction? So my first Ubuntu prediction is that Ubuntu will be certified and available pre-installed on the framework laptop. Ooh. So currently, if you buy a framework laptop, you can either get it with Windows on it, if you buy one pre-configured, 
or if you go for the DIY edition, you can either choose Windows Home, Windows Professional or no OS. But they do have some FAQs and some forum threads about people running Linux. Mm. So my prediction is that that in the future, you will be able to buy a framework laptop with Linux on it and it will be Ubuntu. You said in the future. Are you going to give a, a, a ceiling on this or just at some point in the future, you'll be able to buy one? Uh... <laughs> No, just, 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 no, obviously okay. you can't do it Open now. Ended. You will be able Open to. Ended. Before either framework goes bust or Canonical goes bust, you will be able to. <gasps> wow. Okay. So I would add to that, that I, in amongst those framework FAQs, they do explain that they have picked hardware that is Linux compatible. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you go for the no S option, it should work. What you need, need to do, Mark, is find some sort of, friendly local distro maintainer that would you know do some you know hardware spin for you or something <laughs> do you know what i was going to say is given none of us work for canonical we don't have the inside edge on forcing this to happen uh so uh we can just hope that it happens <laughs> yes. but I, I do make this prediction as it will be ubuntu ubuntu not ubuntu mate oh ah, oh disappointed nice one, nice one. Excellent. Uh, what about you, Martin? What's your first Ubuntu prediction? My Ubuntu prediction is that NVIDIA will be the commercial sponsor of Ubuntu. Instead of Canonical? Yes. Oh, so all those Microsoft are going to buy Ubuntu uh, things, you reckon it'll be NVIDIA will become somehow the sponsor. How do you figure that's going to pan out? Uh, inside baseball know-how. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> that's not fair. W- why not? I'm <laughs> speculating. I'm making it up. Do you believe that NVIDIA will buy Canonical and therefore become the the company behind Ubuntu? Or do you believe that, that they will take over Ubuntu from Canonical? As Alan says, you know, the the sort of go-to argument amongst the unimaginative is Microsoft will buy Ubuntu. Yeah. And I think that's a bit flimsy and not very interesting. And as Arthur C. Clarke once said, you know, if my predictions seem realistic to you, I have not done my job properly. <laughs> so consequently, I'm going for this one. You know, NVIDIA are a massive silicon vendor. Uh, most of the workloads that NVIDIA care about happen in the cloud on Linux-based operating systems, which is predominantly Ubuntu. It's Mm -hmm. odd to me that NVIDIA do not have their own operating system to exploit their product services in silicon. So I say at some point in the future, NVIDIA acquire Canonical and Ubuntu becomes their vehicle for delivering their platform and services to the cloud. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I yeah, well thinking of all the companies that could invest in Canonical, that wasn't on my hit list and I think I think you're right in that everyone thinks of Microsoft as the one like uh, and has said that for years, and it's really tedious. It's everyone has, if I can make a it's make a like a wish list item for everyone after the show ends, <laughs> can you all just stop saying that? Yeah, it's really tedious and not imaginative at all. If it's not Nvidia, it's Intel. <laughs> Hedging your bets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've got fourteen years. The 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 brief in the show notes was a prediction for the fourteen years. I'm going to go with Nvidia first, but if it's not Nvidia, then it's Intel. Fourteen years. Mm. I'll be retired by then. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And on that bombshell, uh, my prediction, uh, in case anyone wondered, is that Canonical will, this is my Ubuntu related prediction, Canonical will shutter Launchpad and move all development onto GitHub. Everything, wholesale. They're, I think it'll be migrating individual projects initially. And then they'll start moving the build systems. They'll move everything over there, whether it's GitHub Actions or using third-party tools like Travis or CircleCI or or some other tool or Azure Cloud. It'll happen all over there. And Launchpad uh, issues will be migrated into uh, GitHub and Launchpad will be shut down. I hope you're right. (laughs) I just, I just don't, I, I think there's just too much inertia. I just don't think it's going to happen, but I hope you're right. I think that would be wise. So much development happens on GitHub. It's so easy to get, um, drive by contributions. How about this? Instead of GitHub, why not like a hosted GitLab instance, which got, has got more of the sort of underpinnings that Launchpad provides? I did consider that and I thought, that is a wish list, uh-huh. not a prediction. 
my i yes i would like them to switch to another free software hosting platform and gitlab would be the one that i would think would be the best one for them to go to but my prediction is they go to github okay there you go um we've got some non ubuntu ones mark what's your first non ubuntu prediction for the next 14 years apparently yes so i think sometime over the next 14 years spotify will stop streaming music what well, just become joe rogan forever and podcasts only i think that they will pivot to podcasts as their primary media so as far as because as far as i can work out when it comes to streaming music record company make a bit of money artists make hardly any money and spotify makes a loss as far as i can tell and i'm not a particular business person but i don't think that's sustainable forever and alongside this spotify have been pumping a lot of money into podcasts and there is a lot of money in podcasts in terms of you know sponsorships and ad revenues and you know really targeted advertising and i think that's what they're going after with that and they are getting you know a lot of people you know some people would say they're not actually podcasts if they're exclusive spotify content but it's what they're calling them Mm. um but i i think at some point in the future they're going to have to stop doing music in the way that they do it because it's losing the money and there's no point if they're going to make money off off of podcasts. I see you've been reading the small print on our contract that I alluded to <laughs> last episode. <laughs> well, okay, you know, interesting. Um, <laughs> I mean, 14 years is a long time. And in, well, interestingly, I was thinking about it and at Spotify, I remember hearing about Spotify while I was sitting in one of my lectures at university, which was probably just over 14 years ago. So mm. it's been going about that long. And so they've got just about that long to change. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of streaming services who've fallen by the wayside, and Spotify has been a bit of a a, a clinger on, uh, contrary to like most of the others. Like, yeah. yeah, Google Music disappeared, and there are plenty of others that have come and gone and tried to take the crown. Um, I wonder if something else will usurp Spotify, or whether someone will acquire Spotify. What if Apple acquired Spotify? And then absorbed all of the um, music into mm. Apple Music, and just the paid podcast just became the only thing that Spotify was used for. Could be. Mm. Okay, Martin, what's your next prediction that is not Ubuntu related? So my prediction is that Nix OS will become the new. I use Nix OS, by the way, distro of choice for Linux enthusiasts. What does Nix OS have that Arch doesn't? Because Arch is perfect in every way, <laughs> has no flaws, and is the best Linux distribution for enterprises, consumers, mobile devices, and all use cases. And it runs snaps. Yeah. And how can Nix possibly beat that? It's okay that you're wrong. <laughs> um, so Nix, Nix OS has at its core the Nix package manager, which is a functional package manager that sp- speaks the modern language of why Linux is a billion dollar or multi-billion dollar industry. Linux is dominant in the cloud and it's the container primitives and the container language and the container ecosystem that makes Linux so very powerful there. And Nix OS has this built in at its very fabric at the operating system level. And therefore, I see that as people, as developers and DevOps and DevSecOps and what have you start to move over to using Linux on their own workstations, of which there is a good number already, they will be choosing Nix OS because it's the easiest way for them to create the container images of their applications and platforms that they're deploying to the cloud. So if someone said to you, I will give you a small bag of money to stop working on Ubuntu Mate and make Nix OS Mate, what benefit would there be? For who? Well, (laughs) for you, your users. Well, for me, it would be a bag of money. (laughs) Well, of course. Of course. (laughs) Um, in professional circles, we're using Linux today. We're using things like Docker, Docker file, Docker compose, um, you know, build packs, um, multi-stage builds and all the rest of it. Nix just has all of that built in and it's very easily accessible. And if you look at sort of where the, the thought leadership for 
containers is right now, there is a group of people saying, hey, this nicks, this is hot stuff. We should be getting in on this. This is the best way to actually make our images and our containers. And I think it's that business sector where time and money is important that's going to be a driver for popularizing this movement in desktop Linux. That's excellent marketing, but you didn't answer my question, but that's okay. okay. Mark, what did you want to say? So if if you think the driver is going to be from business, uh-huh. do you think that that will translate to the enthusiast market though? Yes, because I think the enthusiast market is behind the fact that Linux is a multi-billion dollar industry and they don't realize they're using an operating system that's capable of taking people to... Uh, the outer reaches of space and landing, you know, robots on a on another planet. And I, th- I think the sooner we grapple with the fact that that's where Linux is best and what it's used for and realize that that isn't running shonky shell scripts to install software and running applications in non-secured namespaces. As soon as everyone else catches up with that, then <laughs> this prediction will will follow. Okay. All right, my prediction, which is uh, not technology-based, within five years, see, not even 14, within five years, it will be commonplace for governments to nudge people to go vegan or vegetarian. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be quite the push in the same way that governments around the world are giving incentives to um, better insulate your home or to use electric vehicles or to use public transport, whatever incentives they are, veganism will bubble up to that same level and governments will be encouraging people to eat less meat in a more pushy way, in a more nudgy way than they are right now. Is this because of uh, shortages of lorry drivers being unable to keep the shelves stocked with meat and CO2 shortages, meaning that it can't be packaged properly anymore? No, I think it's the unsustainability of feeding billions of people with you know, cows, chicken and pigs. I think it's as simple as that. I think they they need to find other ways to feed uh, mankind in the years coming, and they will realize that the best way to do that is to stop people eating meat but eat protein in other forms, which is not um, animals that get killed. It, not for um, uh, yeah, respect for the animals. That's not the driver for this, I don't think. But that will be a selling point that's used. I think the, the driver for this will be it's unsustainable for billions of people to eat meat. Right. So this is a sustainability argument, yes. not a fat tax or, or eat less sugar opportunity. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, well, good news. The largest biomass on the planet is uh, insects. So uh, mm-hmm. I look forward Absolutely. to our new crunchy diet. <laughs> It doesn't have to be crunchy. You can you can break them down and make them into cakes and uh, all kinds of nice, delicious things. They don't have to be crunchy with legs and hair. Mm-hmm. You can also dip them in chocolate. I I understand. But hold on, hold on. We're talking. We're still talking about animals here. If we're talking about insects, aren't we? Are you specifically yeah, saying plant based uh, foods? Yeah, I mean that's an alternative. But I I think it's going to be. I, that's not my prediction. Insects. <laughs> right. Your prediction isn't that we'll all be encouraged to eat insects. No, my, well, that, that may be part of it. That may be a sideline, but my prediction is people will be encouraged to be vegan or, or vegetarian. Right. Gotcha. Mm. Well. And we have one final bonus prediction, which is a bonus because all of us thought of this <laughs> prediction. So we all agree on it. Um, Mark, what is it? By the next LTS, that's 2404, name yet to be decided, the Ubuntu desktop will no longer be GNOME shell based. So this is the next but one LTS, because there's Mm -hmm. one in 2022, which is Mm -hmm. next April. So Mm -hmm. we're talking about the following two years Mm -hmm. in April of 2024. Mm -hmm. Yes. So two and a half years from the point which we're discussing this now. Okay, so that bonus prediction, we all decided that that would be a prediction and that would come mm-hmm. true by that LTS in two and a bit years' time. What we didn't agree on, or what we, I, I don't know whether we agree on, is what it will be if it's not Gnome Shell. <laughs> Who wants to go first? All right, I'll go first. I think Ubuntu will develop a brand new whole cloth desktop. I don't think they'll reuse... Plasma or XFCE or any other currently available desktop, they will sponsor the development of something new. 
I agree. Oh, completely. I didn't expect that. I thought you'd say Marty. <laughs> no, no. I completely agree with everything that you've just said. I could go further. <laughs> Even after Unity, you think that they would do that again? Yeah, Unity yeah. was done four times, five times. Yeah. So they've, they've got um, a track record for having a design, having a pattern, and uh, executing on that pattern in multiple different languages and frameworks over the years. And I think they'll do it again. And do you think it would be based on the GNOME libraries again? No. No. <laughs> You think this would be a clear break from GNOME? Canonical have been investing in Flutter for some time now, and I, I think it would be foolish to to dismiss something implemented in Flutter as the future direction. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it would be Flutter or something else that comes along, or like Rust, or who knows what. I don't know. I don't know what that would be, but it's not GNOME GTK. There might be GTK oh, yeah. to draw a box on the screen and then paint what's inside it with Flutter or whatever, but I I, I certainly think it's it's something other than no mere stop. Yeah, I, d I don't think it will be cute or GTK. I think it will be one of these um, sort of emerging mobile uh, frameworks that uses GL as like the rendering engine mm -hmm. and there is some other toolkit, you know, behind that that, that renders the widgets. So, Mark... You obviously thought this was going to happen as well. So what was your vision of how this was going to be delivered? Well, I didn't have as clear a picture of what it would be. But if I was to if I was to just put my money on something that already exists, because I didn't have in my head they were going to develop something new. If I was to put my money on something that already exists, I think it would be KDE Plasma. Um, because, I mean, two reasons. One, Kubuntu has been around for yonks as an official flavour and it does very well. And the second part is that KD has a brilliant community around it as well, who I think would be very welcoming um, of Ubuntu using it as a default desktop. I think you're right on both counts. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. They're, they're, that, that would be an excellent decision, but Canonical won't make that decision. I agree. Is what, my, what I think. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think agree. you're right. I think Plasma would be the right choice, right. but they won't do that. I will bow to your superior knowledge uh, uh, on this, I think. If Plasma was the right choice, it was the decision that would have been made in 2017. Well, we shall see. On that bombshell, that's the end of our predictions. Uh, drop by the Telegram channel if you go to ubuntupodcast.org slash Telegram and tell us we were right or wrong in 14 years' time. Set yourself a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time for a double bubble command line love. Uh, first up, we have GoTop. And GoTop is something I use on all my machines in order to monitor CPU utilization, network, um, top processes, uh, disk IO, temperature of CPU, GPU, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, all that good stuff presented in a kind of retro ASCII aesthetic with um, extended character set to represent graphs of the CPU. I'm trying to paint a picture with words and failing. And your hands in the air. Yeah. Uh, but there'll be a, a link to an image in the show notes which shows what it looks like. Um, and it's quite pretty. And it's written in Go, Golang. And it um, it's a single binary. You just run it and it presents the data in an animated form. And it's quite pleasant and uh, quite lean and easy to use. It is all of those things. Uh, and I enjoyed using it earlier in the week. But then four days ago, there's more. So first, the Ubuntu podcast told you about Bashtop and it went viral across all of the Linuxy internet telling you about Bashtop after we told you about it first and then how Bashtop became BPyTop and we told you about it first and then it went viral all across the internet and now BPyTop has been replaced by BTOP. Plus plus. They're not very good at naming things, these BP people, are they? They do love re-implementing them in every language <laughs> imaginable, however. So <laughs> Fair enough. What's uh B top plus plus written in? So B top plus plus is written in C plus plus, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um and in much the same reason that Go Top is written in Go, which is a good choice of language because it's very efficient. Bashtop and BPytop suffered with the fact that they are an interpreted uh 
languages in air quotes and therefore a bit slow and for system monitoring not ideal mm -hmm. so anyway btop single binary you can download it from their github it looks just like bash top and bpy top that came after it and they're going to be piling in a whole bunch of features in the future it looks gorgeous i have a better looking picture in the show notes yeah well all right you've got like a bazillion cores on your cpu and so yeah you run it on a sinclair spectrum like i do so you only have one <laughs> core <laughs> so yes you'll find information in the show notes for how to get b top plus plus and the superior go top uh, thank you for everyone who sent in uh, Command Line Loves over the years. We have thoroughly enjoyed testing them out and sharing them with the rest of the internet and making them go viral. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And now it's time for some of your wonderful feedback. And a big thank you to everyone who sent feedback to tell us how much you've enjoyed the show over the years. It's been uh, very lovely to to read your messages of, um, I would say condolences, but, <laughs> not dead. but you know, it's, it's lovely memories. to hear people say nice things and fond memories. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Ollie Smith sent a message to us in our Telegram channel, which is ubuntupodcast.org slash Telegram. Regarding your brief discussion about AI applications that aren't sinister facial recognition stuff, there's quite a few things related to radiography that AI is great at, breast cancer and eye disease identification in particular. Hopefully the protein folding work will also be helpful in drug discovery. There's also things like route planning on Google Maps and also battery optimization in Android. You can probably tell I worked for DeepMind in the last few years for the examples. Thank you, Ollie, for restoring my faith in the application of AIML for social good. Jadine tweeted at Ubuntu Podcast. Just listening to season 14, episode 28, I get the love for the netbook edition. I loved KDE netbook mode. It's why I bought a netbook back in the day. I remember installing KDE netbook edition or Kubuntu netbook edition on my EPC. Um, unfortunately, I felt like they had a fatal flaw in that you couldn't just stab a single shortcut key and start typing to search for applications you had to go and click something which on a netbook was a real pain in the bum <laughs> whereas i liked doing things with the keyboard and that's all your wonderful feedback and that's all for ubuntu podcast thank you for listening